And, and we find that uh, God takes farmers and puts them in places of power like Amos in the Bible. He said, I'm not a prophet, I'm a farmer. And John was placed as leader of the National Party. Uh, and so I hope you feel at home in the bush today, John, because in, we're in the bush. We got literally kangaroos running around among the gum trees. Right here, the first day, the first day I was here, I woke up in the morning, I slept in that house just over there. I kid you not, I was from Williamstown, Melbourne, where the houses are like close. And you, you've got a, not a quarter acre, you, you've got a four hundredth of an acre. And, and, and on my first night here, I, Kim and I were here, I looked out the window and there was a kangaroo looking straight in. <laughs> Welcome to Tasmania. So, uh, John was uh, leader of the National Party, and then obviously that he became leader uh, and deputy prime minister for quite some time. And most of us would be aware of his battle with illness that he had, which under doctor's advice and probably under um, marital advice was told to relinquish the stress and responsibility of that. But I'm going to let him tell you more of his story in just a moment, except to say Thursday night, we still have people talking about Thursday night, the impact you made on people Thursday night. Now, I've got to tell you, to hear a, I've been around parliamentarians who swear and cast and carry on, and, and then the moment I walk into the room, it's, uh, hello, Reverend Father, and yes, praise the Lord, and God bless you, and you know, they, it's almost like they've got a halo, you know, they just put it on, and and, you can, and what they don't realise is you can spot it a mile off. And uh, that's not the case with John. He's a man of prayer. He's a man of commitment to the gospel. And we welcome you here today, John. Thank you. Let's put our hands together for John Anderson. Uh, it's working properly. The reason I ask is that it wasn't the other day. Apparently it was scratching up here somewhere and was a bit hard to listen to, which I'm a bit embarrassed about because... You don't want the medium getting in the way of the message any more than necessary. I quipped the other night that I learnt a long time ago to check actually the beginning whether people can hear you and whether they're comfortable. Uh, it happened in a little town called Garar. I wouldn't imagine anybody from Tasmania has been to Garar. It, no, I can see they haven't because I know they would have put their hand up if they had. Garar is in uh, the northern part of my electorate between Moree and the Queensland border. And I was there back in the days of opposition in about 1992, a uh, backbench member of parliament, been asked out there to explain how the then proposed GST of 15% was going to work. And the hall in Garar is unlined, it is a tin hall. And it started to do something that it doesn't do out there terribly often, it started to rain. Uh, and uh, you couldn't hear yourself over the din on the roof. Uh, and uh, somebody yelled out, we've been hearing about this GST, is that a business input? Can we claim the rebate on it? <laughs> uh, but I could only just hear him, and I could see a fellow down the back, and I asked, I yelled out to him, Bill, this overless din, din, can you hear me? And he replied, he said, as a matter of fact, I can, even over the noise, but I'd really like to change places with someone who can't. <laughs> so I learnt that it was better to ask at the outset whether or not people can hear me. Andrew, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, and uh, thank you more broadly for your invitation to come back to Launceston. I was asked uh, by several people to come back after I'd resigned because shortly after I announced I was stepping aside, I was in Launceston in the middle of uh, 05, uh, and uh, this is the first time I've been back since. And we've done a number of functions around the place, and my wife and children are about to have uh, three or four days now hiking in various parts of your beautiful island. Uh, and can I acknowledge Mike Berry? Uh, and uh, all of you, it's, it's good to be with you. Now, Andrew has asked me to do something that I'm not usually very comfortable doing, and that's saying something about how I personally became a believer. Uh, but in the same way that I cooperated with the person who wrote that book, which people keep referring to as my book, it is not my book, it is written by Paul Gallagher, who's a good Christian fellow from Melbourne, 
who was once a journalist in, in my part of the world, about me. Uh, and when he came marching through the door about three years ago with a contract from Random House to write my story, I remember thinking I'd really rather he didn't, uh, but before God I'll simply try and answer his questions and he can write the book and I'll leave the rest in the Lord's hands. I have not read it and have no intention of reading it. Uh, so because I'm not comfortable talking about myself and my own story. But people sometimes find it useful, so in the hope and prayerful belief that it can be of some encouragement to some of you, uh, I can tell you that I grew up uh, uh, in northern New South Wales in a very conservative, traditional grazing family. My father had served with some distinction, I have to say, uh, during the Second World War, but he had had a truly horrendous war in every way. Uh, he was extraordinarily badly wounded and not expected to live uh, at Alamein with the 9th Division fighting Rommel's troops in the Middle East. He was invalided back. He found that his childhood sweetheart, for I think genuine reasons, uh, had decided that his pleas that he would not marry during the war in case he was killed were in fact uh, an excuse. Uh, and so she had married a dashing American officer and gone to live in America. Unfortunately, the dashing American officer turned out to be a cad. He was, amongst other things, already married. Uh, and uh, so she re re divorced him, which was quite scandalous in those sorts of circles in those days, and came back to Australia. And uh, my father did marry her uh, in 1954, and I was born in 1956. Uh, my sister was born quite soon after that, in 1958. Uh, but tragically, my mother, who was, uh, although not young by the standards of those days because of the interruption of the war, still only in her 30s, uh, was uh, misdiagnosed as having indigestion when in fact she had stomach cancer and she died when I was three days short of my third birthday, as I recall, and my sister was very young indeed. So that left us in a circumstance where I suppose it's fair to say that despite the best efforts of many, including my father, who really, in retrospect, I've just been reading, and it's on the public record, the story of that ABC lady who's going to contest John Howard's seat. Her mother died at an early age, and she and her sisters were farmed out. But my, farmer didn't, my father did not do that, I think greatly to his credit. Uh, and he made certain that although it was hard out where we lived to find people to look after us, uh, there was always someone there. We had a succession of governesses, uh, most of whom I recall with utter horror, uh, but, but one in particular, a lady I loved till the day she died, perhaps almost as my own mother. I remember her once, as I suppose most children even today do do, um, we'd been given, my grandmother was uh, a Christian, we'd been given the little golden books about, remember those? I suppose they still have them, do they? About God and what have you. And I remember asking this particular governess, who was God? What was God? And I don't know that she had a very clear picture, but she certainly did not, uh, reply in any disdainful sense, she explained as best she could uh, that God had been somehow formed out of spirits in ways that we didn't understand and that he had created the earth and made us. 